So I'm going to talk about exposing the work that I've been doing, exposing algorithms. <laughs> oh no. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm a computational journalist. I work at the University of Maryland um, in the Computational Journalism Lab. And computational journalism is really about applying computer science to journalism. So either developing newsroom tools um, for the purpose of gathering data, tracking stories, um, personalized news, comment moderation, and a bunch of other things, um, as well as using computational methods to investigate our own stories. And in this case, um, the stories that we are um, investigating involve algorithmic accountability and transparency. So why should we care about algorithms? Well, they're in charge of, or have a big influence on a lot of uh, pieces of our lives, um, from using Google search to um, hiring and firing, automating um, through uh, CVs and resumes, um, deciding, like giving us recommendations for things. Um, it's used a lot in the criminal justice system, either for predictive policing or deciding how to sentence somebody or if somebody gets parole. Um, Airbnb, uh, it's everywhere. So how do they work and what, do, what happens if we think they're wrong? Um, a lot of the time, if, someone, if you say something is determined by an algorithm, the response is, oh, I, don't, I can't argue with that, it's an algorithm, it's, it's an objective decision, there's no way I can um, uh, disagree with that decision. Uh, there's, the computer is way smarter than I am, it must be right. Um, and a lot of the time, companies uh, will defend this position by saying, it wasn't us, it was the algorithm that made the decision, it's, um, we're innocent. But they're failing to recognize that algorithms are written by human beings. And human beings will write the algorithm based on their own biases, whether they're aware of those biases or not, um, and the agendas of the companies that they're writing them for, and um, a number of other things. So then what happens? This is an example of someone playing with the Facebook algorithm. Um, so he writes, hey everyone, big news. I've accepted a position trying to make Facebook believe this is an important post about my life. I'm so excited to begin this small experiment into how the Facebook algorithms process language and really appreciate all of your support. So he got 62 comments at this point and um, they were all like number one or number two in my feed. So there's something that the Facebook algorithm is doing that detects enthusiasm and excitement and turns that into like, an importance metric and then decides how your post gets ranked on someone else's feed. Um, so that's a fun experiment. Um, so I'm going to talk about two uh, case studies, I suppose. One is a Google search study um, that I was not part of, so this would be very brief. And the next one will be an Uber um, study that I did do, and I'll go into more detail about how we did that. So Google has an autocomplete function, as we all know and love, um, and in their frequently asked questions, they have a section that says, we exclude a narrow class of search queries related to pornography, violence, hate speech, and copyright infringement. And that makes sense. You want to make it a bit harder for people to find things on the internet. Um, autocomplete makes things easier for us to find what we're looking for. Um, but what are the criteria for um, pornography, violence, and hate speech? Um, copyright infringement is probably a bit easier to determine those boundaries, but for the others, it it's, might be pretty tricky and maybe very objective. Um, so what are the differences between search engines as well, and are there any mistakes? So how would you look into this? This is, you know, it's a black box algorithm. We can't you know, um, look at it directly, but we can control our inputs and from the outputs, we can determine how it might be working. Um, so this is a warning for, for the YouTube editors um, before this goes out, maybe. So this is, in the circles, we have in blue all the words blocked by Google, and in red all the words blocked by Bing. Um, <laughs> all one of them, and uh, two, two words that both of them block for whatever reason, and a bunch of words in black that neither of them block. So they'll autocomplete for those other words, but they won't autocomplete for any words inside the circles. 
And it's a little confusing because I, I see some of your faces and you're as confused as I am. Like, what is, how is this decided? There were some offensive or unsavory words that are completed and some other words that some of us would think are completely fine that are not auto completed. So how is this decided? Um, I, I like that they do do this, um, but uh, you know, it's how are they deciding these things? Um, so it says, um, the reason they would prevent autocompletion is also to protect vulnerable peoples. Um, so uh, one group of vulnerable people is children. So how, what happens then if you add child to the front of that autocomplete? Does it make it more stringent or less stringent? Luckily, it's more stringent. So fewer words get autocompleted if it's preceded with the word child, which is great. But there are some words, um, again, that we would maybe think should be also added to the exclusion list that should not be autocompleted. Um, so, you know, what is the criteria for this? How is it decided? And search engines are complicated to research, um, and they are, you know, how are people using search terms in real life? You know, we as experiment as scientists can only guess um, or we could perform surveys to find out how people do searches in real life, but we're limited in, in some ways. And there's personalization to look out for. Um, we did, this was all done with um, incognito mode. Um, and then there's randomization tests, A-B tests that search engines do. Um, and also Google and Bing and other search engines don't really want to be scraped. Um, so then going to the Uber case, um, so this is a little different. So this was a story that was published earlier this year in the Washington Post. Um, it was entitled, Uber seems to offer better service to areas with more white people, and that raises some tough questions, which it does. And this, um, amongst all the possible kinds of stories that you can look into with algorithms, this falls into the category of looking at um, whether there's discrimination or um, unfair treatment. So the previous work with the Uber um, stuff, so um, Nick Dikoplos, is my boss, and he did some research on this the previous year, looking at um, search prices. So search prices are triggered by car requests outnumbering available cars. So demand is more than supply, so they trigger a search price, um, which encourages more drivers on the road, and redistributes current drivers to those areas where there's a search. But he found in a study last year that that's not actually the case. It really, as, well, in DC anyway, the surge price really only redistributes current drivers. Um, surges can last for maybe only three minutes at a time, so drivers learn that that's not worth getting off the couch and getting into the car, because by the time they get there, the surge is gone. So the current um, study was uh, proposed that um, service quality may not be the same across DC. Um, and we measure service quality as expected wait time, um, which combines a car availability with current and historical pricing and other hidden factors. So we decided to call it service quality. Um, and if it's true that it is different across DC, it, can this be explained by census data? So there's a bunch of tools, um, and th these slides will be shared after, so don't worry about knowing, um, getting all these down if you're interested. But um, the data sources, we use the Uber API, um, UberPy, which was a script that my boss wrote for the project last year, um, CensusGov, which has tons and tons and tons of free data, um, open data. Then the sampling, spatial sampling across the district was done with uh, Python-based GIS-related tools, um, GeoPy, Address, and SendPy. SendPy is for census um, Python, and it's the geographical data. So um, the shape files, the boundaries, um, and other um, geographic related information. Um, also used uh, FCC Gov, which uh, returns, which is a government based API, um, that returns an address when you give it a long lat. Um, it's very, very slow though, and a bit, uh, sometimes it would just like go offline and you're like, oh, I need to collect more data. Um, and then uh, we sampled using a grid and average across census tracts. Data wrangling was all done in pandas, numpy, and stats models. And then they're visualized using Carto, formerly known as Carto DB, and um, was, was free for three maps, and then adjusted with some Adobe Illustrator, and then Matplotlib and Seaborn for the graphs, and again, a little um, touch up for prettiness for the um, Washington Post publication. So, more detail on the collection. 
first we had to determine how we were going to sample the tracks across DC. So there's a couple of ways we could do it. Two could be um, that we just drop a pin, one in every tract, and collect from there. But that doesn't really account for the different tract size. Some of them are much, much bigger than others. Some of them have a lot of parkland. So that's, again, difficult to, to how do you work with, with a majority of um, a tract being park. Um, so how do we sample that? So we decided to do a dense, a, a, a grid-like um, sampling across all of DC. And then if, a, if we have a larger tract, we'll just average those points together. And if we have a smaller tract, then hopefully the grid is dense enough to catch those tiny tracts. And then that will be a, a one, one pin would then represent that tract. And then we've got temporal sampling, um, which we limited to three minutes because um, in the previous study, um, it was found that the shortest surge time was three minutes. So as long as we got every three minutes, then we would make sure that we didn't, didn't um, miss any surging. Um, and of course, all of these as a trade-off, as a spatial temporal trade-off, um, due to the fact that we have API rate limits. So there's always something to check if you're using APIs, is what is the rate limit? And I think for Uber, it was 1,000 an hour. Um, so if we've got almost 300 points, we want to do every three minutes. It's like, maybe that's more than 1,000 an hour. <laughs> so then how many friends do you have with Uber <laughs> accounts uh, to get all their access keys? Um, and then there's address validation as well. So we might um, have, we might be able to get all the points that we want, but those, some of those addresses might not be valid. So I'm just going to hop over to um, GitHub real quick. Um, so everything's open on GitHub. And we've made all our code available. So this is 2016, in March, the WAPO Uber paper. And these are all our files. Um, and this is, no, go up. Uh, this is the, the, um, the script that I used to gather the locations from which we would get the, uh, the wait times for Uber. So mapping points across DC, very descriptive. Um, so. I measured the widest points of DC, longitude and latitude, and the broadest points of DC, um, and chose a, a beginning and an end, and then created a list by filling in in between with um, point zero 0.01 increments. So once I had my long, longitude latitude list, I then passed each long lat pair to this, um, this API that I mentioned earlier, this government API. So if you give it a long lap pair, it will return to you a full address. Um, so then we get the address, and I only collect if the JSON returned has DC in it. So my grid is going to look uh, like a, a square, but DC is very helpfully not a square. Um, so then I wanted to exclude everything that was Virginia or Maryland. Um, so then that's how that worked. And then put it all into a dictionary, and then make the dictionary into a, um, a data frame. And then looking at the data frame, we've got our block, state, address, and longitude and latitude. And that's great. But then you want to look at it and see that it does actually fit inside of DC, and I've not done some, something weird, like flipped my long lats, for example, because that would be a bad idea. Um, so I just saved it as a CV, opened it in Excel, highlighted the longitude latitude, and put it in this <laughs> very cute little um, web tool called Hamster Map, where you can just paste, paste the long lats, and it will plot them. So that's nice. We've got a grid that I expected. Um, but you can see that there's like a ton of dots in the park and lots of dots in the river, and you'd never ask for an Uber, an, uh, Uber in the river or in the middle of the park. And I don't know if you've found that if you're in the wrong part of an airport, you open the app and it will say, hmm, you can look for a car when you get to a road. And so you know, it's important to make sure that the addresses were valid. Otherwise, the, app, the API wouldn't work. Or we might get some weird results. So to validate the addresses, I used um, a little Python call tool called address, um, which passes the address that I got from the other API into um, pieces. Um, so like the number of the street, the name of the street, that it's a street or a road or an avenue, um, et cetera. And I said, so long as it's, um, if, the, if the address has a house number and if it has a street prefix, make it a real valid address. And if it doesn't, then it's not a valid address. 
So we ended up with getting 234 valid ones and 130 invalid addresses. So some of that was because, um, yeah, they fall in parks and rivers and or on, on our highways. So you, again, you'd not probably ask for an Uber when you're on a highway. Um, so they've got a list of all the points that are outside. They're all invalid addresses. Um, and I can check those one by one if I wanted, or just go ahead and get um, some new points. So I added all those addresses. Um, uh, and then I had to count uh, which tracts were represented and which were no longer represented. So if, address, if a tract had three points and none of them were valid addresses, now that tract is no longer represented. Um, so using the, the geodata from the SenPy um, API tool, um, this is all 179 tracts for DC. I can count and add a column to count how many of my data points, rep how many of my tracts are represented and how many are not. Um, and if they're not, then I'll use the, the SenPy derived data to obtain the center long and the center lat for each of those missing um, tracts. So I've got center lat and center long, set those together, add them to my, um, uh, that API that I used before from the government that will then, if you give it an, a long lat, it will return an address, get the address, and then go through the process again of validating that address, and then iterate. So by the end of that, the, the, the bit that I could not, um, I ended up with uh, five address, five, uh, tracts that were not represented, so I, I had to get them by hand in the end. There's only so much you can do programmatically, and in the end I had to do them by hand, which is not um, the best, but I couldn't think of any other way to do it. And we had a deadline as well, so there's sometimes you just got to do it by hand. Um, so yeah, then this is finally, this is what we get finally. So you can see that we've avoided the park, we don't have anything in the river, um, we've got some nice um, uh, a nice distribution there. All right, this is that a little bit bigger, so it's a bit clearer about where we were sampling. So this is our sampling. So we got expected wait time from the Uber API. The Uber API returns expected wait time and what the search price multiplier is. So um, we measured every three minutes for the temporally, the sampling was every three minutes, and we measured over the period of four weeks. This is back in February. There was no snow days. We made sure there was no snow, no interruptions, no holidays. Um, so it's like a four weeks of what we think is normal Uber function working. And then for each tract, we calculated the mean wait time for that whole four weeks, and we also calculated the proportion of time each tract spent surging. So a surge was considered with the multiplier more than one. Um, the census data we got from the American Community Survey, because the uh, census 2015 was not out yet, even though this is 2016, um, so we used the American Community Survey from 2014 and calculated the percentage of people of color. So we had to dichotomize um, race and ethnicity into two, that's what dichotomize means. Um, and so that was a tricky conversation to like decide how to make that, how to dichotomize um, POC. Then we also used uh, percent poverty, as that often um, correlates with, with percent POC. Population density, you have to as a control, because um, you, would, you would assume that uh, wait time would be, always be less where there's high uh, population density. And also medium income. And then everything was uh, z-score normalized. Um, so the processing again, just collapsed across the four weeks, average within data uh, census tracts. We only used Uber X, because that's the most commonly used car. Um, and then, so by the, end of we, by the end of that, we have one value for ETA, one ETA and one surge price multiplier per tract. And there are 180 tracts. And then for the census data, um, we have poverty, income, race density, population density, and, and it's all normalized disease scores. So this is an example of um, a map. This is not a statistical map, this is just the raw data, this is the, the mean wait time per tract in seconds. So as expected, we'd have, um, my mouse was working, but now it's not working. So in the center of the map where the, where the color is um, a light yellow, that's the shortest wait time, which you'd expect, because downtown, there's gonna be more people driving around. 
and longer wait times for those in the outer, outer areas. Um, and if you know DC, then you'll know that in the, the southeast, um, the demographic is mostly people of color, and the northwest is mostly white people. But you might notice in, in Edgewood, um, where that the Edgewood label goes to, that's track number 92.03, which has a 75% um, POC, and they also have short wait times. Um, and the reason for that might be because of the universities and restaurants in the area. And as you expect, Georgetown also low wait times. Um, and then you got uh, DuPont and Logan just pointed out there for reference. So we applied a regression analysis to this um, with the um, with the dependent variable being mean wait time, um, and the explanatory variables being people of color, percent, population density, median income, and poverty. And we use interaction terms for people of color and poverty, and people of color and income. And uh, the stars represent what was actually significant for that um, for that uh, GLM. And then we have the graphs, which I made in Seaborn, I think, um, that just demonstrate that. So on the left, in red, that's um, the um, normalized POC against wait time, and then in the blue, so that so th the the higher percentage of POC, the longer the wait time, and the other graph in, with the blue line shows that with a higher percentage of POC, you get a lower proportion of time that that tract is spent in surge. So what does this mean? Um, Uber's comment was um, obviously that they're not a racist company, and no company is going to do anything like this on purpose. I mean, a lot of it, it's difficult to create an algorithm that doesn't, um, that doesn't impact someone in an unfair way. It's a really, really hard thing to do. Um, also, from our study, we can't really determine if the results reflect demand or supply differences. Um, so, you know, maybe if someone in an area, um, uh, maybe if there's no one opening the app in certain areas, it's never going to surge, and so drivers are never going to go there, which means the wait time's always long, which means when you do open the app, it's a long wait time, so you, then you don't use the app, and then it's a, a circle. Um, maybe it's crime stats, so maybe people don't want to go to areas because of perceived or real crime risk. Um, and is that perceived or is that real? Um, the number of banked or unbanked. DC has a, about 14, depending on where you read it and what year you read, um, it's about 14% of unbanked or underbanked people. So that means they either don't have a bank account, they don't have credit cards. It's difficult to use Uber if you don't have a credit card or like a, a um, PayPal account. Um, a smartphone ownership might also be a barrier to using Uber um, as opposed to using taxis. And would the results differ if you were looking at a different day or different month or different year? So what would be next? Maybe next is um, to look at taxi demand. Uh, is the taxi demand different? Is that pattern different than for, for Uber? Um, is there differences in prices, accessibility? Is it a marketing issue? Um, do are unbanked people likely to pay for taxis with cash? Um, could they, could they maybe develop a way to pay, to not be dependent on, on credit cards and banks to pay for these services? Is crime perception different from real life? Um, would it be possible to maybe include crime stats inside the app, or would that make things worse? Like, would that even be useful or not? Um, and then transparency. So we as journalists, um, also need to be transparent. So like, how did, I, how did I come to this decision? How did I get to this result in my experiment? Um, so since we're advocating for algorithmic transparency, I should also be transparent. So we have, um, uh, this work is on GitHub in the Comp Journalism GitHub repository. So it provides a, an, uh, an avenue for Uber to make a response if they wanted, or whoever it was that we were writing about, they can look and see, like, did they do this right? Have they forgotten something that, that's really important? Um, so it gives them an opportunity to check our work. It gives anyone else an opportunity to check our work as well, um, so we can be accountable to, to others. It also spurs me, anyway, to write better code. So if I know that other people might be looking at it or might be using my code, I'm going to make sure it's better and um, prettier, more elegant. Um, and it forces, it spurs you as well on as well to make sure that the conclusions and, and the your thinking process is right and 
um, that you end up with the same story that you began trying to. Because it's so easy to go off on a little like a meander when you go through the data analysis and you end up proving something that you didn't originally ask. Um, so this, this helps to keep you all in line. And it provides an opportunity for other people to use your code or your data. So other people have used the code and the data that we've shared, which is really great. Um, the code is all on GitHub, like I said. Um, everything's in iPath and Notebook with documentation and readmes and in um, commented code. Uh, the data was too big for GitHub. GitHub has a limit of 500 megs, so we put this in a zipped file in Google Drive. Um, it's also helpful to save wrangle data at various intervals. Um, so that other people, because other people might not want to run your whole experiment from the very beginning, they might only want to look at a set, from a certain point on. Um, so this gives them the opportunity to do that. And if and when possible, find programmatic solutions. That's not always possible, um, but it makes it easier to document if you can have everything in code. And obviously everything's free and open source. Um, so that was half an hour. Um, we're always interested in collaborations. So if anyone's interested in collaborating on anything related to algorithms and accountability, then do get in touch. These are my details. Um, and does anyone have any questions? Yes. What was, what was Uber's original PR around her statement regarding the assertion that they were, that their service was um, not uniform across different parts of the city? Um, so the question was, what was Uber's response to the assertion that uh, the service was different across the city? And prior to you doing this study. And before we did the study, I don't, I don't know what they would say before the study. I mean, after the study, they just said that they, it's a very generic um, response that they, they try and provide the best service possible and that they're always trying to improve um, and that obviously they're not racist. Obviously. Um, that goes without saying. Um, but I don't recall any, like, I don't recall them saying anything about different service across cities that they would be responsible for, for example. So they didn't deny it or anything? No, they didn't deny that, no. Yes? I was, I was going to just comment that yeah. as a driver. Oh, yes. I, I drive for part-time for Uber and Lyft. Please. But the thing is, is it's, it's basically the law of supply and demand. It's, it's basically, you get a heat map, and mm. you, you never so you never chase the surge. So you have a heat map that says, these are the hot spots to yeah. go to. But you have to, as a driver, you have to think like a passenger. Where, where, where would I need to be picked up? Mm. Like so it's not like, as a, as a driver, you're saying, I'm not going to go in this area because it's a high crime rate or something like that. For me, right. it's more, you know, I'm going to go where the demand is. Mm -hmm. And you're hoping to go on the outskirts. You don't want to go in like the downtown areas because those trips are going to be shorter. I'm going to go on the areas on the outskirts because those trips are going to be longer. So for me, it's more beneficial uh, as, a, as a driver. So stuff like that, I mean, that... Your stats are definitely interesting, for yeah. sure. But you know, as a driver yourself, like I said, I'm looking. You know, I'm looking at the heat map. I'm not necessarily going to chase that heat map. Right. But I'm also going to try to to think about where passengers might want to go, and maybe I get longer runs. Right. Yeah. And there's always there's always a, a, a everyone's got different agenda. So Uber has their agenda. The drivers have their agendas, and the riders have their agendas. So a rider wants a cheap, fast ride. Yeah. A driver wants a expensive ride, so the surge surges, um, and Uber just wants happy, well, they just, they're a business, they want money. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, it's like balancing all these agendas together, and they're not, um, they're not all, um, they're not necessarily converging on, on the other agendas. So it's, it's tough to, to maximize and make everyone happy in that situation. But we've, we've also looked at um, Uber driver forums, and, and they're a fascinating place to go if you ever find yourself with some time to spare. Um, so um, yeah, like people share tips and tricks on how to maximize income and minimize time, um, and where they will drive, where they won't drive, how can they avoid picking up certain people or going to certain places. Um, and, and so, yeah, I've read a, um, at least one saying, this is more um, uh, um, 
this is just a story, it's not like a fact that every driver does this, but you know, at least one person said that they will, if they have to drop someone off in an unsavory neighborhood, they will then turn the app off, drive somewhere better, and then turn the app back on again. So they don't you know, get, get um, called, um, get requested during their time in that area. Um, one of the comments to the article was um, an angry person saying that of course they didn't go to those areas because they didn't want to insert crime. Um, I, think this, I think the actual word was I don't want to die or something. Um, <laughs> but I mean, from the stats that I've done so far on, on the crime statistics from 2013 to the present, there's no indication that crime is actually a factor for um, wait times and service. So that could be an indication that it's a perceived risk um, that's not actually real. But it also goes to the passenger side of the fence as well, where you might be 10 minutes out, and I'm okay picking you up, but then what they'll do is they'll say that you're more than 10 minutes out, and they'll cancel and re-request. So even though a driver's in process, so it looks like the drivers are not servicing those areas, the drivers are on route to go pick them up, but mm. then because it's vice versa, I can cancel on them, they can cancel on me, but yeah. the problem is is that you're on route to go pick that person up that's more than 10 minutes out. So yeah. I figure that's your, that's your downtime. I'm not getting paid to come get you, but that passenger is canceling and re-requesting, re so it looks like there's longer. Yeah. I mean, that, that kind of, we, we can't look at that from our experiment because we don't get actual rider driver data. Um, so this is just, if we, open, if we open the app using the API, what is the wait time for the cars around at that time? Right. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, are there other things you could do with it? Could you distribute it to the riders somehow or the drivers to... That might be breaking control? terms of use agreements. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, that's, that's a little bit beyond our journalism. But, you know, everything's available online. So if someone else wanted to pick that up, then that they're free to do so. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, so the question was that we considered um, controlling for population density, but did we control for uh, facilities, amenities, shops, restaurants? Yeah, because I, I mentioned that. Huh? Tourist locations. Tourist locations. Um, we've done some preliminary work on that, and there's nothing. Well, that's on my list of things to do. I've not found anything that I can talk about right now. Okay. But it'll be out it'll be out soon. <laughs> yes, little teaser. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. We got uh, 32 comments um, and some of them it was a range. It was a range that you'd probably expect from a wonk blog. So some people saying that's really interesting, some people being angry, some people saying, well, did you think about this? And I did, because it was in the article. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you can, the, the link on, my, on the GitHub page, there's, the, the title is a link to the article. So if you, if you wanted to read it, but the comments are closed now. So they only have the comments open for a certain time. Um, yes. Uh. So what would you like Uber to do? Would you like them to do something? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. So the question is, do I, what do I want Uber to do? Would I want them to do something different? Um, and that's, this is an ongoing conversation. So the, the area of algorithmic accountability is um, still under a lot of exploration right now. People, uh, what is the responsibility of Uber? Is it Uber's responsibility or is it, um, is it reflecting um, more city infrastructure? Is it a government problem? So what, what is this? And we still don't know. I don't. I don't have. Um, I don't have a, any I, ideas right now. I mean, ultimately, Uber's going to go to a driverless situation. Um, so that'd be interesting to see what happens then, because they're taking out a bias from the equation. You know, the the human driver bias. Um, so that'd be really interesting to see how that works out. But yeah, I don't know. And the, 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 the research I'm doing right, the, right now with, with the extra data that I've collected to, to try and answer some of those questions that I asked at the end, um, 
I'll be better able to answer that question after I've got those results in. So again, teaser. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, cool. Thank you so much.